Hello and welcome to the tutorial on overview and importance of data quality for machine learning tasks. This tutorial will be delivered by Nitin Gupta Shashank, Majumdar Shazia Afsal and Hima Patil. And we are all part of IBM Research India Lab. And before proceeding further with the tutorial, we would also like to thank uh, all our colleagues uh, at IBM Research who uh, who have helped, who are working on this area with us and who have helped put the material for the tutorial together. Okay, so this is what uh, we are going to do as part of this tutorial. We're going to spend the first few minutes uh, talking about the need for data quality measurement with respect to machine learning applications. And, uh, you know, why is this very critical in today's world? Uh, and then we are going to basically do part one and part two, we are going to do a deep dive on uh, a few uh, uh, data quality metrics for uh, uh, different modalities. So first we will talk about the structured data and then we will talk about uh, quality metrics in unstructured data. And finally, we will focus on, uh, you know, the need of human in loop for data quality measurements and, you know, what is the state of the art and what are some open challenges here? Okay. So with that, let's get started on, uh, you know, the need for data quality for machine learning. Uh, most of you must have seen, you know, articles which have said that, you know, uh, data preparation accounts for about 80% of the time, you know, it is the most consuming activity in a data science life cycle. So the question we asked ourselves was the following, right? Why, why is data preparation the most challenging activity in a data science life cycle, right? And maybe we should under, try to understand the challenges which can help us, uh, you know, uh, try to optimize some of that, right? So, uh, and that's where we started and we said that, okay, this is what a data science life cycle looks like, uh, right? A data scientist gets uh, data, they would do exploration, gathering, analysis, clean, you know, build some features, build a model, right? And go and communicate the results to the user and, and, and voila, they're done, right? But, uh, you know, this is really a very theoretical uh, cycle, right? In practice, you know, a data science life cycle really looks something like the one on the right, wherein a data scientist gets the data, you know, they would do some cleaning, build some features, uh, build a model, um, and then realize the model is not working up to the expectation. So go back and do some more cleaning, build, you know, better features, uh, build a newer model and et cetera. So in reality, it is really an iterative debugging task, which is, you know, cumbersome and uh, time consuming. And then the question to ask is, why is this an iterative debugging task, right? Why is it not as, you know, how we show the theoretical, you know, picture on the left, right? And one, one of the reasons for that is that at the start of the process, right, even before we do anything with the data, the data scientist uh, or the user doesn't really know what are the challenges in the data, which is why, you know, uh, and then there is no straightforward way to know all of them, right? So which is why they have to go through this iterative cycle, if you will, and uh, discover challenges along the way, right? And it's become more of an art rather than, you know, science, if you will. And that's, that's precisely, uh, you know, which made us thinking and which I think, you know, drives the point towards the need for data quality measurements for uh, machine learning or a data science life cycle. So, you know, if we could do data quality analysis at the start of the process, so, hey, you know, here's the data, let me run this through a data quality analysis, right? It would help in the following ways, right? One, you could know the issues in the data beforehand, right? And may make, more informed choices for data pre-processing and model selection. It will also reduce, uh, you know, in some ways, turnaround time for the data science projects because now you, uh, now instead of uh, doing the iterative cycle, there is uh, uh, there is some rhyme and reason as to why we are, why one would make a particular choice for a particular data pre-processing technique or a model selection technique, right? So uh, essentially, I mean, the goal is that data quality, if we do data quality analysis at the start of the process, you know, it can help us to go from the right hand side of the picture towards the left hand side. And we may not reach exactly there, but it will help us in the process. 
Now let me take a concrete example. So for example, let us say in a given data set, right, uh, we ran it through various data quality analysis and we found that there was uh, overlap between two classes, right? So at step zero, right, at this point, a data scientist, you know, gets the data and also gets associated information and says, okay, this is a two class uh, binary classification problem. And there is about 30% overlap between class A and class B, right? This immediately gives me or a data scientist some information and says, okay, right? Now I do know that, you know, which means there are some features which, which are weak. Maybe we need to do some better feature engineering or I do need to pick up a model which is, you know, complicated and, you know, I mean, it's complex and take, can take care of these kind of complex scenarios. Okay, so, so, so that's how, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that is why we think that data quality analysis is uh, crucial for machine learning life cycles. And, you know, to, I, I, and that's, I think, you know, one part of the story and we've looked at, you know, some of these challenges, uh, you know, keeping the data scientist, uh, you know, uh, looking at the, from the lens of data scientists, but really in an enterprise data, uh, data life cycle, there are several personas who work together in, you know, complex ways and all of them are uh, necessary to actually build, uh, you know, uh, to build successful models that can go into production. Right. So, for example, the data steward, the business user, the subject matter expert, right? And and uh, and 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 this is where we think that there is a need uh, of for platforms or frameworks that allow all these different personas to work with each other in in a collaborative fashion, and uh, and and thus the need for human in loop techniques. To, so that you know we can build algorithms which are uh, which are uh, which are which are useful to and and easy to use by any and all of these personas. Right? So to put it all together, uh, we uh, uh, here are uh, here is what uh, you know we propose that uh, uh, there should be a data assessment and a readiness module. Uh, right as step zero, as soon as you get the data, which will analyze the quality of data and uh, and not just analyze the quality of data, but also tell a data scientist by pointing to regions of data with low quality uh, that here are the problems. And uh, if a data scientist knew this at the at, at step zero, then they could, uh, you know, make informed data pre-processing or model selection choices. Also, similarly, right, I think uh, the, uh, uh, just to reach at the point that, uh, um, you know, uh, a subject matter, uh, we need tools that a um, uh, subject matter expert could easily use. So let's take an example here. For instance, let us say uh, the data, we did a data quality analysis on the data set and we found that uh, uh, on the Y or the labels for the given data set, the target variable, some of uh, the labels are noisy. And uh, now uh, if a data scientist finds uh, the label, they will need uh, you know, a subject matter expert to review um, uh, the noisy labels and agree before the labels can be changed because that is principally how we have defined the machine learning problem. So there is a need for tools of how the subject matter expert and data scientist can work together and also ease of uh, ease of use for the subject matter expert to say, hey, you know, um, uh, row number five, um, I do agree with your recommendation that this is a noisy label and we should change it, right? So in a sense, essentially, I think there's a need for algorithms that can assess training data sets and we're going to talk through some of them today, as well as talk about some open, open challenges. Uh, there's also a need for all these algorithms across different modalities. So again, we're going to talk about the structure and the unstructured um areas uh, today uh, and and there's a need to allow for complex interaction between all these personas and uh, and that's where you know we need uh, human in loop techniques to so that uh, they can collaborate with each other very easily and in a sense right i think uh, there is a strong need for automation for all of this to happen uh, with uh, as man uh, as less manual efforts as possible 
So uh, moving forward, right, to summarize, uh, essentially, uh, you know, we have seen that within research and even in the industry, um, lots and lots of, you know, progress has been made with machine learning models, right, uh, to make them smarter, faster, uh, automated, etc. right? However, the quality of a machine learning model is going to be directly proportioned to the quality of the input data. So there is a need to, for systematic study of measuring the quality of data with respect to machine learning tasks. And that's what we're going to focus in the tutorial today. So let's, let's move to you know, our first part of the tutorial where we will be uh, talking about the data quality metrics for structured data. Um, this is how we think is a good way uh, to organize this section wherein we're going to cover the following topics. We're going to cover, cover data cleaning, class imbalance, label noise, data valuation, data homogeneity, and data transformations. Um, uh, so let's, let's start with the first one, right? So data cleaning, right? Maybe what, uh, you know, data cleaning is a term that we use um, uh, so often, right? Uh, so what are, I think, uh, we, we're, what are some things that come to your mind when you hear the word data cleaning, right? Maybe missing values, uh, you know, outliers, inconsistencies, uh, uh, duplicate uh, rows, etc. Right. Uh, so this could these are some common problems, uh, or there's some common data cleaning um, uh, issues uh, issues that are solved with data cleaning methods. Uh, but a more a more interesting question is that do data cleaning techniques always help in building machine learning pipeline? Right, and uh, and if not, uh, right, we will talk a little bit about that, uh, and and some recent work that people have been doing in terms of building joint techniques for uh, uh, cleaning as well as the model. Okay. So let's start with the first one, right? Data cleaning issues can typically be divided into quantitative and qualitative. Uh, issues and um, uh, a lot of uh, there have been a lot of tutorials and which have talked extensively about you know integrity constraints and functional dependency constraints and uh, uh, and so on so this is an area that we are not going to cover as part of this tutorial but we are going to look at you know issues like missing values outliers data linters uh, uh, noise in the data noise in the labels etc and pick up some of these and uh, see, you know, uh, how much, uh, uh, let's try to ask the second question that we wanted to ask, that uh, does data cleaning help uh, with respect to, always help with respect to building a machine learning model? And uh, right, uh, so uh, there was a very nice uh, study which was done by, uh, which is called the Clean ML study uh, last year. And um, they precisely are asking the same question that what is the impact of data cleaning methods on machine learning models? So this is how they have done the study and their experimental setup is they've, they've chosen 13 real world data sets and um, five error types, which, may, which are outliers, uh, duplicates, inconsistencies, missing labels, and uh, sorry, not missing labels, but mislabels or noisy labels and missing values. And they've chosen a suite of, you know, seven classification standard algorithms and uh, said, and basically done the test to say that given a particular error type, if I clean that error type, um, will it always impact my classification algorithm in a positive way? So that is the first question to ask, that what will be the impact of this cleaning on the machine learning algorithm? That's one. The second question to ask is that will the cleaning technique have any negative impact uh, on the machine learning algorithm as a result of the cleaning, right? So for example, will it induce some kind of bias in the data, right? So, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about what the study found, but before we go there, um, uh, this is how the study has defined uh, what is the error type, which is missing values, and the detection method is, if an empty is entry, it can be detected as a missing value, and the repair method is, right, they have used several different types of imputation methods. Similarly, for outliers, the detection method is isolation forest or use of uh, IQR or SD, as well as the repair methods is either delete 
uh, and throw away the outliers or impute uh, right data in some useful fashion right similarly for duplicates right uh, the detection method is uh, key collision and the repair method is deletion similarly for inconsistency they use a detection method which comes from a tool called open refine and uh, you know the repair method is basically to merge the inconsistencies found and we'll be talking about some of this in a in a lot more detail as part of the data transformation when we talk about that right uh, and the final one is mislabels or noisy labels wherein the detection method is given some ground truth and assuming that your ground truth is uh, you know is gold standard uh, right uh, uh, if your label is going to not agree with the ground truth that is going to be your detection method and the repair method uh, right is going to be flip labels right which is uh, which is uh, quite easy for which makes complete sense for binary uh, classes and for multiple classes this is a little bit more involved but we'll live with uh, flipping uh, labels for now both uh, both uh, the noisy labels part as well as uh, uh, detection of inconsistencies and repair of that uh, we will be talking about uh, both these methods in a lot more detail uh, in the same section. Okay, so now that we have, uh, you know, built our setup uh, that, you know, we have a bunch of open source data sets, we have a bunch of classifiers and we have, uh, you know, um, certain uh, error types and how we detect these errors and how we repair these errors. What the study did is they basically, you know, um, uh, for each of these data sets, right, uh, tried detecting uh, and repairing these errors and uh, ran uh, you know classification algorithms before doing any cleaning and after doing cleaning and this is what the paper reports uh, as the study that um, of the five error types uh, that they had looked at uh, inconsistencies outliers and duplicates had insignificant to you know slight positive impact on the data if it was cleaned, but it is also shown that uh, you know uh, for inconsistencies, uh, if you clean it, the impact is insignificant. But it will, it is definite that it is not going to produce any negative impact. Similarly, for outliers, the impact is uh, uh, insignificant to positive, but it is also possible that uh, it could have some negative impact on the data. Similarly, for duplicates, uh, the impact is insignificant if you clean the data out of it, but it could have negative impacts uh, because you basically uh, removed some points and it could uh, negatively impact your classifier. But what is interesting is that missing values and noisy labels came out as you know two error types which clean uh, are in general have shown to have positive uh, impact uh, right uh, on the data set however for it depends on what kind of repair mechanism you use for missing values because it could have a negative impact uh, if the imputation is far away from the ground truth for example it could it is possible that it could induce bias in the data set which could have which could be the negative impact it right? similarly for noisy labels um, you know the impact is positive on the classifier if uh, this is clean However, if the data set accuracy originally is less than 50%, then it is very hard to say whether a label is noisy or, you know, it, it generally is a, a hard classification problem. Right? So the takeaway from this slide is that based on the general patterns that they saw across the different uh, data sets and the different train test settings, uh, it was found out that missing labels and missing values in general have a positive impact uh, and uh, one has to be careful about what it could have a negative impact uh, based on the uh, based on the repair method that is chosen uh, this basically uh, i mean uh, you know brings us to a conclusion that there there isn't a you know if somebody asks the questions right uh, data cleaning uh, if done blindly may or may not necessarily improve the quality of the downstream machine learning models. The impact of it really depends on, the study found that it depends on different factors like, you know, what cleaning algorithm is used and the set of parameters used for the cleaning algorithm. It is also a little bit dependent on the machine learning model that is chosen. And uh, there's another study and there's another paper which is called as Learn to Clean, 
wherein they have also shown that the order in which the cleaning operators are applied has a big impact on you know how much the data set is going to be cleaned for example one could apply uh, missing values uh, uh, one could do missing value imputation and then do outlier uh, or do outlier analysis and then do missing value imputation and it could lead to different results so in nutshell the conclusion out of it is that while uh, the standard missing uh, well the standard data cleaning uh, uh, error types and algorithms have been known um, it is uh, we are still there is still an open area here in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know finding the right ones so there is no blanket algorithm which can be used and said that hey you know uh, once you use this this will um uh, always short short improve the quality and there is there is the opportunity for some research work to be done in this space moving forward right uh, so we spoke about data cleaning and within that we did call out uh, the problem of label noise and data homogeneity and transformation so this is what we will discuss uh, in the upcoming sections but before we go there you know we will spend a little bit time on the class imbalance problem right and uh, there's a reason the class imbalance problem has been very interesting because uh, the class imbalance problem is, is is quite well known in the sense that you know it means that there's an unequal distribution of classes within a data set and uh, for example let's say if you are doing fraud detection then uh, it is uh, it, it is it is very it is quite normal to expect that your data set would have uh, uh, would have you know very few fraudulent cases whereas uh, a large number of uh, non fraudulent cases let's look at some other examples uh, where data with one pattern is more common than other for example you know activity recognition or uh, behavior analysis like for example recognition of a dangerous behavior or uh, or healthcare uh, problems in the healthcare space uh, where you are trying to analyze the severity of a cancer or uh, fault detection uh, in industrial machinery uh, and and so on right so uh, so uh, so there are uh, so there are problems that exist and uh, the nature of this problems is that the data will be imbalanced from a classification perspective now a class imbalance right is is not a new problem this has been known for a very long time but uh, and it's an important problem uh, however we are going to spend a little bit time on this tutorial to talk about uh, you know what are some factors in the data that affect the class imbalance problem and uh, you know what are some open areas in this space so uh, let's let's uh, talk about you know why is classification of imbalanced data hard um, uh, typically most classifiers uh, uh, with the exception of a few assume that uh, the data is balanced so if you are using uh, some standard uh, some metrics like accuracy uh, then you know uh, they are bound to show you high values but you know actually uh, your classifier might not be doing uh, a good job right uh, and that is because that there's an unequal cost of misclassification errors where false negatives are uh, important more important than false positives okay so uh, this is where you know we talk a little bit about evaluation metrics for imbalanced data set uh, and like I, like we just said, right, the accuracy may not always be a good measure for this. Uh, and typically, people have shown that F1 score and these other metrics are the ones that should be used in a scenario when you have balanced uh, data set. Uh, but now let's talk about you know some more interesting parts about uh, imbalance, right? Uh, one easy way to calculate class imbalance. Uh, is to say, hey, I have a two class problem, and I have, uh, if I count the number of points in class one and I count the number of points in class two, if there is imbalance in the number of points, then I have an imbalance ratio, thus my problem is um, 
is a, is a, is imbalance which which is definitely is uh, one of the factors that affect class imbalance but may not be uh, but there may be other factors that affect the imbalance nature of the class right so for example if you look at it right if you look at the imbalance ratio uh, this is definitely a problem because the learning algorithm is uh, going to be more biased towards a majority class and it's possible that in some cases minority sample can be considered as noise or in the confusion region priorities can be given to the majority uh, majority classes however the question is that is imbalance ratio the only cause of performance degradation in learning from imbalanced data uh, no right so let's look at a few other um, uh, factors that will affect uh, along that will affect and uh, that will affect the class imbalance problem the first one is uh, presence of overlap in the data where, among the majority and the minority class right uh, so in this case uh, it is possible that the minority data points can be just considered as noise because it's a small number of points uh, from the minority class in the overlapping region all right so uh, beyond counting on the number of points how the data is distributed between the majority and minority classes play a role and class overlap uh, between the majority and minority classes is definitely a factor that affects imbalance the other thing that affects imbalance is that if your minority class is fragmented into smaller sub concepts right so the anyways have uh, we are anyways in the scenario that the minority class has uh, much lesser points then the majority class but now assume a scenario that the number of points within the minority class they are still divided into smaller sub concepts or uh, or, or or clusters if you will uh, this this affects uh, this uh, this affects the problem of class imbalance uh, even more and this is a very and, and one could expect a problem like this to occur because let's say let's take the example of fault detection in industrial settings the fault detection methods could be and there could be different reasons uh, by which a fault occurs in a industrial machinery hence it is quite possible that within the minority class one could see concepts forming up where each concepts where each concept relates to the kind of fault from the machinery uh, similarly data set size right so uh the data set size is another factor that affects the imbalance so having a data set of size 100 versus a data set of size 10000 is going to have a difference uh right uh, and and frankly the point is that all these effects in a combined way uh, affect uh, the imbalance uh, ratio much more than just counting the number of points right so what we can see here is uh, is analysis that was done uh by by uh, by uh, authors of uh, the paper overlap versus imbalance where they have tried uh, where, where they have done several experiments to show how the with the variation of overlap and variation of imbalance and variation of both how do the f1 scores change across uh, change across the different settings okay and uh, we could see that uh, for almost all cases the uh, if you if you vary both the f1 score we could we can see that there is a trend that uh, the scores uh, that that all of these curves decrease as you move from uh, left to right and as you are increasing the uh, the uh, the issue in this case uh, let be it overlap or be it uh, uh, imbalance or be it a combination of both right so the red line see shows that as you increase uh, for example in this case as you increase uh, the number of uh, issue points uh, which have overlap and imbalance the the score is going to reduce right and um, uh, each of this different plot uh, basically uh, signifies the same experiment for different data sizes and we can see that data size also has an impact on the same so uh, so what should be done right so what we have seen so far is we have seen cases wherein class imbalance uh, is an important problem 
class imbalance, uh, the most easy way to find out if there's a class imbalance or not is by counting the points in the majority class versus the minority class. And uh, we have also seen that between the majority class and the minority class, based on how the data is distributed between the two classes, other factors like overlap uh, or uh, presence of uh, small subconcepts can further aggravate the problem uh, of class imbalance. And uh, in typically in literature, uh, people have um, shared various mechanisms of dealing with uh, modeling strategies for imbalanced domains. As part of this tutorial, right, we will we will talk about you know uh, the resampling kind of methods uh, in the in the data space uh, of uh, what can be done, right? Uh, since we are going to look at everything from the view of uh, uh, data quality analysis. So resampling methods, uh, uh, there are three standard uh, and very well-known type of methods. Either you can oversample uh, the data, you can undersample the data, or there are ensemble-based techniques where uh, a combination of oversampling and undersampling techniques are used. However, the bigger question to ask is that, uh, you know, across uh, the, uh, you know, uh, does resampling, right? So any of the other types, uh, any of the above types, be it oversampling or be it undersampling or be it an ensemble method, will it always help with respect to uh, uh, classification? Or does, uh, or can we say that is the impact of imbalance recovery method same on all the data sets? And the answer to it is no, right? And uh, which is why, uh, so let's let's look at this example, uh, which has been referenced in the paper uh, uh, Bayes Imbalanced Impact Index. And the authors basically bring out three cases here, where case one, the majority and minority class samples are very well separated with each other. And in this case, right, uh, if they if they are very well separated, uh, there's a very high probability that uh, one could still build a good classifier that could separate the two classes here. Let's look at the scenario B, wherein you know there is, a, uh, there is a complete overlap between the majority and minority class. And in those scenarios, uh, right, uh, uh, doing undersampling or oversampling, et cetera, may have uh, very little to no impact on the uh, prediction accuracies of, in, or in the prediction, uh, uh, metrics, be it F1 or another metric of choice for the minority class. Uh, the third kind of case is partially overlap, where you know some samples of the majority class are going to uh, overlap with the minority class. And um, in this scenario, it is shown that you know based on if we choose the right method, it is possible that it could have an impact. Uh, however, right um, yeah, there is. Uh, however, in this scenarios also. Um, one has to find out uh, the right set of uh, right uh, right repair mechanism or the right uh, set of oversampling, undersampling, or a combination to see uh, a, a high impact. Uh, so, uh, to conclude this section, right, we would say that uh, class imbalance is definitely an important problem. The data distribution factors affect the class imbalance problem beyond just the difference in the number of points in the two class. And um, uh, even with the plethora of techniques available uh, for oversampling or undersampling of data, um, based on how the data distribution is, they will have a different impact on uh, the on the classifier accuracy, right? And uh, Hence, to conclude, this is still an open problem as to determination of whether whether one should resample or not, uh, given a class imbalance problem is a, is is, a, is an open problem, and there is a scope there is scope for uh, research uh, in this space. We will now move on uh, to the other parts of uh, the data quality metrics for structured data. And I would invite uh, my colleague uh, Nitin Gupta to take us through the rest of the presentation.